one thing. Vic, what's the one thing you want people challenged with pain to know? I, I want people to know that pain is a perception, not a sensation. That's my one thing. Yeah, I mean, for, for many years, pain was considered a sensation, not largely influenced by the work of a guy called René Descartes, who was a French philosopher and scientist. And, and Descartes posited that something happens to you on your body surface, for example, and that activates a group of specific sort of, um, in his case, channels in later days. Um, people thought of specific receptors that transmitted a signal, often re, um, called a pain signal, that travels from the periphery up to the brain, rings a bell in the, in the brain, and then people feel pain. And that's a basic sort of schema uh, of a sensation. Um, a perception would, would posit that whilst you are we, um, receiving lots of sensory information from the periphery, you may or may not attend to any of those things. And, and a, a more modern agenda that I'm involved in is a thing called predictive processing that posits that actually what's happening all the time is you're trying to predict what sort of sensations you're likely to come into contact with and then um, to basically use that information to either confirm or negate those expectations. Um, but, but what that overcomes is this idea that you've got this line labeled, that you've got a pure sort of flow of information coming in from the periphery and your sort of brain sits there as a cognitive couch potato waiting for those events and only then responds to them what, what we now know is that your brain is always making predictions about what's likely to to occur and in fact that probably also modifies the way in which you act on the world to try and also bring those things that you're likely to to need to pay attention to in line with with your prediction so you you generally change your actions as well as the mod internal models of your nervous system and that lends itself more to this idea that that what you actually feel is much more based on those sort of if you like computations between those expectations and then the reality of what's going on in your sensory world as opposed to just this pure sort of relaying of sensory information so it sounds like, you know, we've, we've got this really active brain that's doing lots of, of, of predictions, computations. Um, how does that translate then into a pain experience? Yes, yeah, so a pain experience is, is essentially f under that sort of um, framework is, is what makes be the best sense for that particular situation, for that person or that animal, in fact, in in actually the set of circumstances they find themselves so rather than it being you know a set as we said set sensation a, a passage of information that sort of begins with pain and ends with pain it's actually saying that actually even things that may not be noxious may not be damaging may not even potentially be damaging can actually if the circumstances are correct to confirm a prediction that they may be damaging or potentially damaging, then you would have pain. So that's a reason why perhaps patients go to see professionals like ourselves in the clinic um, and are told by many clinicians, look, we can't find anything wrong with you. We're giving you this really detailed examination, but we don't find anything wrong. And if you have that old fashioned idea, you're sort of stumped then. You know, those clinicians who hold on to that idea of pain as a sensation, it must be coming from something and it must be coming from somewhere. Um, but what we're really saying is actually, you know, circumstances, expectation, anticipation, um, a, a threat which might not be physical could be actually enough to set a prediction that a, a set of circumstances are likely to result in this experience of this thing that we call pain. And so... That's all really cool stuff. So is there a, a place for us to intervene? Is there a way for us to actually do something? Yeah. Most definitely. I think, I think it, it's, it's sort of, maybe I would like to rephrase that. It's not for us to intervene. It's for us to work with the person. It's to use the information they're telling us, their experiences, their actual if you like lived experience of being in pain, taking all those things that, that people who, who are suffering 
will tell you very readily uh, and and actually welcoming them telling you that because they're informing you you know too often that's seen as complaining or you know other words are often used but actually what they're doing is informing you and i think it's it's beholden on us to try and make sense of everything that the person tries to tell us maybe you know maybe not all in one go that that, that quite often is too much of a challenge both for the individual themselves and also for us as clinicians but i think that you know we need to start to try to explain some of these more modern sort of principles and 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 really to give you know, the exciting message for me is that we can treat using quite traditional, if you like, focused sort of types of therapies within physical therapy in the periphery, but we can also use more modern, if you like, often referred to as talking therapies. And, and actually, you know, rather than it being one or the other, it's getting that balance between these predictions and the expectations you know, in a, in a formalized way, often referred to as priors in the sort of hardcore literature, but it's getting those predictions and, and the sensory world to match each other. And I think actually physical therapists are in a perfect position if they broaden their horizon uh, and, and engage more with the sort of, you know, understanding that, that actually what the brain does is not act as this passive recipient but is a constantly active agent in 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 terms of you know involved in the person's actual lived world um i think that that really offers us a huge potential to try to um you know to treat people with a much more focused approach to actually what they're telling us i think that the important thing for me is you know, as as a clinician and seeing people with really complex, often long term experiences of pain, um, they've been told so many things, and and actually, you know that 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 often produces this real. Um, you know, contradiction between what they've heard from different people. So they've been to see someone first and they get a disc or it's a joint or whatever. Um, and then, and then slowly when those things are ruled out, it becomes, yeah, your brain. You know, I think, I think that actually what this does is it, number one for those people, you know, we can try and piece together why those people have said what they did at a particular point in that person's history. And I, uh, and I personally believe that's, that is actually quite easy to do um if if you're broad-minded i think you yeah. can really make sense it also means that you understand the clinicians they've seen and you don't bad mouth them or you know shout them down important for you know our professional colleagues but also for the patient I mean, actually, there's a lovely piece of work by Carl Friston and Chris Frith, who, who wrote a paper on a duet called A Duet for One, which is all about actually how predictive processing underpins good high level communication. You know, you give a message and if my message is, you know, different, then I've got to bring my message in line with yours and you've got to bring yours in line with mine a little bit. So we've both got to find some sort of middle ground. And I think, you know, that actually is a beautiful way to actually look at how we might in introduce these sort of ideas and actually you know, a really good therapeutic model. You know, we, we need to we need to move a long way as clinicians you know i think much further towards the patient than than actually they ever need to move towards us and that might be controversial that statement but but i'm i'm going to i'm going to stand by it i've said it and i'm going to stand by it pain is complex right and, and and it's complex for everyone it's complex for the people experiencing it and it's complex for those people who are treating it and managing it and it's always a challenge it's been a challenge for all of us to read you know the man behind me is, is pat wolf for those people who don't know i was lucky enough to to spend a lot of time in and around pat's sort of you know scientific community um and, and i and i never forget seeing pat read the same paper five or six times perhaps one of the brightest people i've certainly ever met you know, and if he had to read four or five times, you know, a paper four or five times, I think it legitimizes all of us having to do that at some stage, you know, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's, I, I, I think much like all education, you know, it's about commitment to it as opposed to how clever or not clever you are, you know? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thanks, matey. Take it easy. Bye.
you know. I'm, I'm going for a haircut though. I've been I've been sort of collecting this mop of hair. This is the longest hair I've ever had in my life, literally. <laughs> <laughs>